Despite pushback from Blue Origin and ULA, SpaceX has finally succeeded in expanding Starship operations into Florida. Part of this success comes from the full support of a Space Force official, who recently even revealed the first exact launch schedule for Starship in 2026. So, when exactly will Starship take off from Florida? And what role did this official play in helping SpaceX make it happen? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech. William Shakespeare once said, Heavy is the head that wears the crown, meaning leadership and power come with immense responsibility, stress, and tough decisions. That perfectly describes SpaceX right now. Becoming the world's leading private space company didn't happen by chance. At the moment, they're still dealing with the aftermath of the Booster 18 incident at Massey, upgrading Launch Pad 1, and quickly finishing Launch Pad 2, and that's just in Starbase, Texas. Meanwhile, in Florida, thousands of tasks await, completing the Starship pad at LC-39A, finishing two more at SLC-37B, and even building two Starship production gigabays. The pressure at work is immense, and it only gets worse because they're the number one company, meaning every mistake, big or small, is criticized. That's why SpaceX keeps moving fast, pushing Starship's launch schedule forward. Fortunately, Starship Flight 12 is still on track for the first quarter of 2026. This will mark the first flight of Starship version 3 from Launch Pad 2, SpaceX has confirmed. But what about Florida? When will Starship take off there for the very first time? Normally, to answer that, we'd have to dig into the progress of SpaceX's launch pad construction, but that's not necessary this time. Colonel Brian L. Chapman, commander of Space Launch Delta 45, a unit of the U.S. Space Force, has already revealed the timeline during a recent media discussion about the 100th launch of the year at the Space Coast. Early to mid next year is when we anticipate Starship coming out here to be able to launch, and we'll have the range rated to support at that time, he said, adding, KSC is leading the way with LC-39A and the partnership with SPXC there to do the development work to be able to support Starship. This means that sometime between January and June next year, SpaceX could make Starship's first flight from LC-39A. Moreover, this area falls under the Eastern Range, with KSC being part of the launch and tracking network managed by SLD-45. So, Commander Chapman's statement is well-founded. On top of that, looking at the progress of the Starship pad here, the last major update was in early November when SpaceX installed the OLM onto the Flame Trench system. That means most of the heavy work is already done, and the pad is expected to be operational early next year. Once it's active, SpaceX will be allowed to conduct up to 44 launches per year from this site alone, as approved by the FAA in the final EIS, published in August 2025. This intense launch schedule drew strong opposition last year from SpaceX's competitors, Blue Origin and ULA, who argued that the company's crazy launch pace could force them to repeatedly evacuate personnel from their own pads for safety reasons. But in the end, their attempts to slow SpaceX down failed, largely thanks to the support of Colonel Brian Chapman. His unit ensures that all personnel stay clear of the danger zone during Starship testing and launches, effectively allowing SpaceX to continue its operations without major interruptions. Their responsibilities even extend to public safety beyond the spaceport gates, making sure that the region remains secure while these historic launches take place. There's no better time to be present at the Space Coast than right now, Chapman said. We're breaking records for launch frequency. We're gaining orbital capability, which is essential for national security, and we're doing it at a strategically challenging time. In fact, the concerns of SpaceX's competitors are understandable. Starship runs on a methane-oxygen propellant, generating nearly 17 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. And since it's designed to be reusable, each flight produces roughly three moments of roaring Raptor engines, twice from the Super Heavy booster and once from Starship during its return. Its sheer size and power mean that safety zones are based on blast damage assessments much larger than those used for rockets like SpaceX's Falcon 9. When we talk about public safety, we're talking about risk, Chapman said. Today we treat a LOX methane analysis as equivalent to 100% TNT in terms of blast radius. The interesting part is that Blue Origin's New Glenn and ULA's New Vulcan also use LOX methane systems, 
So, limiting launches only for SpaceX wouldn't be fair. If SpaceX flies more often, it simply shows their superior launch capability, and more flights ultimately benefit the nation. That's why Colonel Chapman has consistently supported SpaceX. At that point in the future, I expect blast damage assessments to gradually decrease based on the tests that have been conducted, he added. This is good news not just for SpaceX, but for other companies too. As Starship launches become more predictable and safer, the eastern range no-fly zones will almost certainly shrink even as SpaceX approaches nearly 120 launches per year. SpaceX's Falcon 9 is already flying at a similar pace. The blast hazard areas for these launches are small and short-lived because the Space Force's confidence in Falcon 9's safety is extremely high, Chapman said. So in the future, we can hope that Starship will reach the same level of safety. So competitors won't have to worry every time this 124-meter giant rockets into the sky. And that matters because in several interviews, SpaceX's influential COO, Gwyn Shotwell, has explained that even though Falcon 9 is already highly reliable, able to fly over 100 missions a year, it will eventually be replaced by Starship for satellite launches. Starship is cheaper, can carry far more satellites, and is at least three times more efficient. Now imagine Starship flying 120 missions a year just in Florida. For SpaceX, that's enormous revenue, massive profits. For its competitors, it's nothing short of a nightmare, fueling fears that one day SpaceX could leave them at least 20 years behind in technology, income, and most importantly, customer trust. Of course, that 120 launch target is still in the future. At the moment, SpaceX hasn't reached that number yet. Only the LC-39A pad has been approved for 44 launches annually. As for the two pads at SLC-37B, SpaceX has proposed a plan for up to 76 Starship launches per year, but these are still under EIS review by the U.S. Space Force. In September, the FAA opened the public comment period, and now it's just a matter of updating the draft into the final EIS. After that, the FAA and USF will issue the official decision, which isn't expected to take long, especially since Colonel Chapman has already said he'll support SpaceX. For now, SpaceX just needs to focus on finishing construction of the two pads. Work only started in June this year, so after five months there hasn't been much visible progress yet. The pads are expected to become operational around 2027. But, wait a second, Florida doesn't have a star factory, and there aren't any megabays like the ones in Starbase, Texas. So, where exactly is SpaceX supposed to build all these starships to launch from the East Coast? Well, the truth is, they are building one. A massive gigabay, just like I mentioned earlier. It's rising right now at Roberts Road, about 8 miles from LC-39A and roughly 9 miles from SLC-37B. With distances that close between the production site and both pads, it's pretty clear what SpaceX is planning. Build starships directly at gigabay, then supply vehicles to both launch complexes from a single manufacturing hub. That way, they don't have to construct a second gigabay, though it does introduce some logistical headaches. For example, they'll need road closures every time a Starship or Super Heavy is rolled out from Roberts Road all the way to each pad. That's a long route, and it won't be simple. But then again, this is SpaceX we're talking about, a company operating at a scale where nothing is done without calculating hundreds of steps ahead in the supply chain. These guys are not amateurs fumbling their way through. And speaking of construction, the Gigabay skeleton is already going up. There's still a ton of work left, but once it's finished, the building will be enormous, over 75,700 square meters of floor space, around 10 football fields, reaching 116 meters tall with 24 giant assembly ports. That allows SpaceX to work on multiple boosters and ships at the same time. When it finally comes online in late 2026 or early 2027, the facility is designed for a wild production pace, one super heavy booster every five to seven days, and one Starship upper stage every seven to 10 days. That means Gigabay Florida alone could roll out 50 to 70 full Starship super heavy pairs every single year. That's the theoretical output, of course. They're not actually going to build that many, in reality, it's almost impossible to imagine where they'd even get that much propellant to feed such a gigantic machine. But, well, that part remains an industry secret. And of course, all of that is still in the future. 
While waiting for Jigabay to be completed, SpaceX still needs rockets ready to fly the moment the Mechazilla Tower and the launch pad at LC-39A go live. So, the plan is to ship all Super Heavy boosters and Starship vehicles from Starbase, Texas to Florida by sea. The stages will travel on SpaceX's new generation heavy barges, crossing the Gulf of Mexico, looping around the tip of Florida and arriving at Port Canaveral, just a few kilometers from LC-39A. Once there, giant cranes will lift them upright, and SPMTS will roll them straight to the pad or into the integration tower. Thanks to detailed planning and two massive barges already on order, scheduled for delivery in late 2025 to early 2026, SpaceX can easily turn this into a routine operation, similar to how Falcon 9 stages have long been brought ashore in Florida. Only when Gigabay reaches full manufacturing capacity will Florida-built starships finally take flight from LC-39A. Until then, throughout 2026 and possibly into early 2027, every East Coast Starship mission will begin with a long ocean voyage from Starbase. And honestly, that alone will be a fascinating chapter to watch unfold. Now, picture this. It's 2030. All five Starship pads are online, firing one after another like a scene from a galactic war movie. On a busy day, you might see five to 12 launches. A super heavy booster lands in six to eight minutes, gets refueled in under an hour, then is caught with a new ship and sent right back up, topping off tankers, feeding depots, and pushing HLS toward the moon. By then, SpaceX isn't a launch company anymore. It's the backbone of an interplanetary transport network. The first Artemis base runs on tens of megawatts of solar power, laying the groundwork for Musk's vision of lunar AI built entirely on sunlight. Solar arrays stretch across the regolith, rising from kilowatts to megawatts, then toward gigawatt scale. AI systems design and command robots that build faster than humans ever could.